Hello and welcome to Asia in Depth. I'm Matt Schiavenza. Conversations about the rise of Asia typically revolve around the continent's growing economic or military clout. But Asia's influence in shaping global culture has been no less important, especially lately. Korean pop music, K pop for short, is as hot a global trend as any. K pop concerts sell out within minutes in the United States and Europe, while Bollywood films from India attract hundreds of millions of viewers from around the globe. Fatima Bhutto is the author of the new book, New Kings of the World Dispatches from Bollywood, DZ, and K pop. She argues that Asian culture poses the most serious challenge yet to America's global soft power dominance. Bhutto profiles Bollywood icon Shah Rukh Khan, by some measures the most popular movie star in the world, and explores why Turkish television dramas, or Dizzy, have become wildly popular as far afield as Peru. Bhutto appeared live in conversation with author and journalist Nermeen Sheikh at Asia Society New York. I want to ask about, you know, how is it that you came to see that Hollywood and American popular culture in general is in decline and that these different genres from totally different traditions, you look at India, cinema, South Korea, music, and Turkey, soap operas, although they don't call them soap operas, how is it that this shift, uh, that you noted the shift and how it came to occur from the U.S. to India, Turkey, and South Korea? Well, thank you, Nermeen. It's an honor to be here talking to you. Um, well, I think if you, if you live somewhere outside of the Western world, if you live somewhere outside of America or, or Europe, then you, you are divided in a way into two halves. Mm. At one point, you are completely overwhelmed and entertained by Western culture. Um, I'm certainly a child of Western, Western culture. I grew up on it. Um, even in 1980s Syria. But at the same time, you have access to so much beyond the West. And you have access to films and music and art from, from all over the world, essentially. So my feeling has always been that there isn't a center in the world. And there certainly isn't a Western center. I mean, we live in a very multipolar world, mm. um, except that's not the narrative that's given to us. And you only have to watch the most recent outputs to realize that it's Western culture is looking inwards and inwards and inwards and inwards to the point of collapse, <laughs> almost. The example I keep giving is this new film which is going to come out uh, that tells the story of Ethiopian refugees, but through Dakota Fanning, who is a white woman. <laughs> You know, that's mm. a sign of its, its inward-lookingness, I think. And, and not just that, you know, um, Zero Dark Thirty is another movie that I always think of because it seemed so insular in its vision. I presume you've all seen a bit of Zero Dark Thirty, mm -hmm. sort of. You're not missing very much, but, <laughs> but Zero Dark Thirty is that film which claims um, erroneously that it was torture that helped America catch Osama bin Laden. And it does these ridiculous things in the film. Mm. So, you know, most of it is set in Pakistan, and any time a Pakistani sort of smiles at someone or has a nice time, something explodes in the background. <laughs> um, you know, there's a scene where a, a man is being waterboarded to within an inch of his life, and the gaze of the camera is not on the man being tortured, but on Jessica Chastain, the CIA agent, who's having a terrible time watching it, you know. <laughs> And at one point, the, the torturer stops to go up to her and say, are you okay? She says, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't, you know, if you're living outside America, that's just almost unwatchable. So would you say that it's changed, though, since, because I'm also uh, sadly a child of American popular culture, has it changed from 1980s Syria? Like, what is it? Because it's not like American culture, popular culture has become more, more inward looking than it was then. It's always been inward looking, so I'm glad you mentioned 1980s. Um, you may remember that uh, Rambo was dedicated to the brave Mujahideen fighters yes. of Afghanistan. Yes. And it's only after they turned out to become Taliban that they had to change that to the brave people of Afghanistan. <laughs> um, you know, Rambo is a great case study because Rambo is about the American civilizing mission just all over Asia. Mm -hmm. You know, he civilizes the weaklings of Vietnam and then Afghanistan and. Um, Rocky, you know, I mean, in those days, the, the villains used to be Russians, at least. I mean, that may come back. <laughs> um, 
that may come back. But even even down to the bad guy boxer, there were Russians. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I don't think it's changed. I just think we have so many more options now. Mm. We have access to so much more that we don't have to watch that. Mm. We can choose to watch other things. And that's certainly the case for many people that I know who are living in Pakistan or, or living in Asia. They're just watching other products. Mm. Well, one of the points that you make um, about the spread of American popular culture then and, and now, uh, you write, quote, American culture was spread not just through the power of its inherent coolness, mm -hmm. but also by the American defense complex. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that military power, if not occupation, is critical to the spread of culture across national boundaries, mm -hmm. does that play at all in the uh, cultures that you're talking about that are now being exported extremely successfully and being consumed all over the world of Korea, uh, India, and Turkey? Mm -hmm. Well, just to give you some background on that, um, you know, 1968 was the peak of American deployment of military personnel. And at that point, there were over a million American military personnel deployed all over the world. I think it's something like 54 countries. So that's not only a huge amount of people, but those people were supported by mach the machinery of bases. Um, they brought in their culture, they brought in their movies, their magazines, their music. And um, they also needed to be entertained. So these were places for culture to be performed. Mm -hmm. So South Korea, which I write about in New Kings of the World, is, is in fact the best example of that. And from 1948, 45 to 48, America ran full military government in South Korea. Um, in the 50s, they have over 300,000 troops in South Korea alone. And at that time, if you were a young South Korean, your options were pretty limited music-wise because of the Japanese invasion and, and um, settlement before the Americans. The most popular music at that time was something called trot. And that was a mix of foxtrot and Japanese choral music, essentially. So that's like your parents' music, <laughs> you know, your grandparents' music even. And if you wanted to listen to something besides trot, there was really only one place to go the American bases. Mm. And if you were a musical um, performer of some kind and you wanted to play rock and roll, the only place you could go were the bases. And in fact, today, um, even though the full military government has ended of South Korea, there are more American military personnel deployed there than in Iraq and Afghanistan <laughs> combined. I think in terms of the new cultures that I write about, that's certainly something that we're going to see in the next few years. You know, Turkey is a great example. Um, they're pushing out um, Turkish power into the world in a very systematized way. Um, and that will potentially include Turkish bases as well. Um, will they then use their bases as a springboard for Turkish culture? They may. They also don't really have to because Turkish culture is springing quite well on its own at the moment. Mm. And, and what about for, for India? I think it really, India is a difficult case because of what's happening in India today. India is hard to tell. I think, mm -hmm. um, I think the Indian influence is, 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 is very wide, um, not just because of Indian power, but also because of Indian migrants. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're the second largest migrants in the world. And they, they, for example, the reason you have great Bollywood fans in places like Uganda or Nigeria or Kenya are because there have been mm -hmm. Indians settled there for a long time and they bring their culture with them. Um, how politics will complicate that, I think, again, is an interesting thing to watch in, in the very near future. So let's talk about um, the Badshah, the king of Bollywood, uh, who you profile and you spend all this time with uh, in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. while he's filming. So I'm sure almost everyone here is, is familiar with who he is, um, but if you could say a little bit about the time that you spent with him yeah. and what you think accounts for his near universal appeal. I mean, he is now apparently the most popular or has been mm. the most popular actor in the world. And just to echo some of what you wrote uh, in the book, um, a Guardian reporter who profiled him said that she was struck that, quote, the hysteria that follows him makes Beatlemania look like a library's convention. 
I thought, wow. Is that Noshi Nikbal? I can't remember the oh, author's name. She did name. a good profile of him, yeah. too. Um, I just, I mean, we can't really see you, but is there anyone here who hasn't heard of Shah Rukh Khan? One person. Yeah. I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> there's, always, there's always a contrarian somewhere. But, um, okay, so one person is still a low number. Yes. Um, Shah Rukh comes from an interesting background, and his background is unusual for Bollywood. Shah Rukh is the son of a freedom fighter who fought against British colonialism. Um, he comes, his fam Shah Rukh's father's family, and Shah Rukh's father come from Peshawar originally. Uh, their family house is still there in Peshawar. And he worked with uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, um, known of course as Frontier Gandhi. And his father was a poet. Shah Rukh himself is interested in literature. I mean, all that's already incredibly unique. And he comes of age um, just as India undergoes neoliberal reforms. That's when actually all three of the Khans, Amir, Salman, and Shah Rukh, break out. They all break out at the same time. Mm -hmm. But unlike Amir and Salman, um, Shah Rukh breaks out in an unconventional way. So his early films... Uh, he doesn't play the characters we know him for today, the sort of lovable boy next door. He plays psychopaths. Mm -hmm. um, he plays stalkers and, I mean, really creepy sort of characters. Mm -hmm. And yet, people love it. Mm -hmm. And people love him. And Shah Rukh embodies a moment in India of, of great change and great hope and great possibility and he's adopted, I think, by all of South Asia at this time. Mm. He's, of course, a Muslim. Um, all the three Khans are Muslims. I mean, the three biggest actors in Bollywood today, as 10 years ago, as in the 90s, are all uh, members of, of a minority. Um, and he encapsulates something hopeful. I think that's partly what accounts for his stratospheric success. And he also moved from television to film, yes. right? Which was a very unusual... He's also... Yeah, exactly. He's one of the few people who moved from TV to film successfully. And one of the nice little-known facts about Shah Rukh is that Arundhati Roy, um, the famous Indian writer, wrote a film. And Shah Rukh had a tiny little part in that film. Annie uh, something, Annie. Get, something yeah, like that, yeah, I've forgotten it. What is Annie? Yeah. Annie gets... Get your gun. Gun Who? or something. Yes. Annie gives it those ones, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and he has a small role in that film. And um, he goes from strength to strength to strength to strength. I mean, he's still making movies. Um, he's still the hero of his films. And he hasn't really slowed down in any way. And what about the time that you, I mean, as a character, oh. you spent a lot of time with him, or several days. How long was it? I it was two days, actually. Two days. Um, I, I was given the choice. At that time, Shah Rukh was um, going to go and uh, record a TED Talk in Canada. So I was asked by his, his team that, do you want to come and see the TED Talk? Or he's going to be shooting for an Egyptian prank show for an Arab channel in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So that was obviously the one <laughs> that, I, that I chose. And I spent a bit of time with him before the shooting, um, interviewing him, and then spent the day with him as we traveled to Abu Dhabi. And it was a sort of planes, trains, and automobiles. You know, there was helicopters and cars and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, I mean, I don't want to ruin... Okay, you may have seen a clip um, maybe two years ago of Shah Rukh Khan uh, in a jeep being drowned in a swamp, and then a lizard <laughs> comes out to eat him. Does this ring a bell? So that's what I went to watch. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, it was, I mean, it was crazy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, because the world of TV and film is so bizarre anyways. Yeah. I mean, now throw a lizard and a swamp and all this other stuff into it. And Shah Rukh. And, <laughs> and Shah Rukh Khan, and it becomes even stranger. Right. Um, but it was... It, I remember that the, the producer and the people around the shows kept saying to me that, you know, we don't think of Shah Rukh as an Indian star. Shah Rukh mm. is an international star. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Egyptian, Indian, same thing. This is, he's one of ours. We understand him. He speaks to us. I mean, that's one of the extraordinary things. He is an international star. You mentioned in your book, and of course it was in the news here when it happened, and it's happened more than once, that he was stopped at immigration yeah. coming into the U.S. Yeah. And it was such a big deal that someone in the State Department had to, apo was had that to apologize. That's yeah. right. I think he was stopped three times. Um, 
He was stopped three times. I mean, that must be the only person actually in the world who didn't know who Shah Rukh Khan was. <laughs> yeah. But it couldn't um, have been the same person. Well, he must have had a cousin <laughs> or something. Um, and, and I think that too is part of his allure to the world. Mm. That here is this incredibly well-known person, this respected person, and he struggles mm. as much as your every man. I mean, Shah Rukh speaks to the every man. I think that's his appeal. And I think it was following one of those incidents, the film, I mean, which is shown in the, the video that you talked about, My Name is Khan, came out in part from that incident, right? Because it's all about this guy who people think is a terrorist. Yeah. And, I mean, it's one and it's of, in the US. Yeah, it's one of his rare political films. Mm. And at its time, it was a brave film. It was a film about a man who has Asperger's and who has migrated to America and he has a stepson and his stepson is killed by bullies in his American school after 9-11 because of his name, because they hear his name and assume he's Muslim and that therefore he must be a terrorist. And so Shah Rukh Khan's character walks across in a very Forrest Gumpian way across the United States of America to tell everybody in the country that his name is Khan and mm -hmm. he, is not a, mm. he is not a terrorist. Um, I don't know if you could make a film like that in Bollywood today. Mm. I'm not sure. Well, so let's talk about that, the, the, which you, know, you, you mentioned, and, uh, you read about in uh, the pieces that you read right now from the book, and you also talk about in the book, which is the, the transformation of Hindi, I mean, was called Hindi cinema once. Mm -hmm. It was not always Bollywood. It became Bollywood only after India liberalized, and it was exported as a commodity. Um, that the transformation, it, it went from uh, being kind of chaste and conservative and modest and representing, uh, you know, the angry young man, which was typified by Amitabh Bachchan, yeah. as we know. And then it's become now this extremely garish and, as you said, pornographic displays of wealth and consumption and Prada and Gucci yeah. and so on. And yet, and of course, uh, explicit, vulgar displays of, you know, drugs, sex, you know, this was all completely uh, verboten in, uh, you know, previous uh, uh, Hindi cinema. So despite that, though, despite the fact that the cinema so clearly does, doesn't represent the dispossessed anymore, mm -hmm. as you show in your writing and as you, you just spoke about now, the people, indigenous people in Peru, <laughs> Uh, still somehow find some resonance in, in this film. Now, race is one aspect of it, but is that what you think explains it all over? All over the world? All over the world. I mean, the sense that it, it actually now, what Bollywood represents is, in effect, the 1%. Hmm. It's no one else. Yeah, I mean, I, it's true that the, the films of Bollywood are such a great mirror for Indian society mm. and Indian politics for any moment. You know, the films of the, the Raj Kapoor films of the 1950s are really about um, a hopeful, idealistic nationalism that's one of brotherhood, um, one of striving towards justice where justice is attainable. Mm. And, you know, the heroes of that era of the 1950s films are not billionaires or industrialists. They're poor men, but they're men with a great idealism for the, for the path ahead. And they are socialist in spirit. And even the angry young man, you know, Amitabh Bachchan's characters um, were still socialist in spirit, mm -hmm. but they were angry. They were furious now at a system that continually keeps mm -hmm. them down. Um, and there was something really beautiful about those films because of that, because they were mm -hmm. films that tried to capture the invisible and the unseen members of society. And, you know, the great stories of friendship and, and so on. And again, you know, the heroes of Amitabh Bachchan's films of the 70s were at home in the village. They mm -hmm. were at home in the village, at home in the city. Um, there were men who were able to, to move between the two. And then by the 1990s, that all changes. Now there's no more village, you know. And if the village mm. is there, it's nostalgic and it's very stylized. And, uh, but the hero of the 1990s films is not a farmer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he, he's the guy who goes to Spain to find his father. Um, you know, he's the, the guy who takes the Mediterranean cruise, you know, with all his closest friends. Um, right. You know, in, in uh, Kabi Khushi, Kabi Ram, they don't even use cars, they just use helicopters. <laughs> so it's this kind right. of absurd materialism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and now, of course, they're very... 
propagandistic. A lot of the films today are very jingoistic and reflect this kind of rightward tilt. But I'm hopeful at least that there are some exceptions. So Gully Boy, I think, is a, oh, yeah. is a great exception. Yeah. And I think Gully Boy is really the best film to come out that I've seen in 100%. the past few years because it recalls old Bollywood. Mm -hmm. Because this is about, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, it's on Amazon Prime, so you can. Um, and it's, it's India's submission to the Oscars, mm -hmm. I believe. It's about a young Muslim boy who lives in a slum. Who in Dharavi, in fact, the biggest slum. In that's it. right, mm -hmm. in, in Bombay, who wants to become a rapper. And there are these great scenes in the film where he's employed as the driver of this rich family's car. And he's got to drive this daughter around to you know all her rave parties and uh, dinners and... And at one point, he's sitting in the car, just endlessly waiting for the girl to come to be done. And he hears music. And because he's a musician and an aspiring musician, he, he's sort of entranced by the music. And he gets out of the car, and he follows the music. And he's almost followed it to the door. Mm. And at that moment, where he's about to step into the threshold, the bouncer, the chokidar of the rave, um, is standing there. And they catch each other's eyes, and the, and the chokidar just does. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was so powerful. I haven't seen that in a film in a long mm -hmm. time. So I think I'm, I'm cautious about saying it's over and that it's just going to be Hollywood excess and Hollywood materialism. It is true that it's more racy mm -hmm. than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, it is true that they are adapting things. So even Gully Boy, you might have noticed, had a lot of songs, but no dancing. You're right. So there's no backup dancers, there's no fountain, there's no, you know, no, 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 snow no. in Kashmir, there's none of that. <laughs> and, and I think that's because they're looking a little westward. The, the question is, will they make films like Gully Boy or will they make films like Uri? That's the question. I mean, that's a, with Gully Boy, in fact, right after that moment, and that's why it had this echo of Amitabh and the angry young man, because right after the moment that you describe, he comes back and he's extremely angry. angry. Exactly. And he sits in the car yeah. and he says, Apna time aega. Yeah, exactly. My time will come. Exactly. Um, but so that's the thing. What, what that film did, it's true that now there is no longer a village, as you said. Um, but there is now a large uh, urban proletariat. Mm. And the films now in Bollywood, even so-called independent cinema they are not preoccupied with the concerns of... So that now when people watch Bollywood, there's this impression mm. that, in fact, all of India must be middle class, if not upper middle class. But what happened to all the people yeah. who came from villages yeah. to urban areas? And were, where is their representation? Unseen. Unseen. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that is troubling. Obviously, globalization, as we know it, has been exposed as a lie mm. because it promised the world that there was going to be this onslaught of opportunity and wealth and access. Mm -hmm. You just had to work for it. And millions of people, so you know, over a billion people have migrated. We live at a time of, an, of the peak of migration that we've ever known. And in countries like America and, and in Europe, the impression is that they're all coming here. But actually, out of a billion people, only about 200 million people are leaving their countries for other countries. The majority, some 700-something million people, are moving within, within their borders, own countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've heard something incredible the other day that within a decade, um, what is it, half of the world's population is going to be middle class, and two-thirds of that is going to come from Asia. Um, but those people are not reflected in Bollywood. They are. Some of them are reflected in, in Turkish shows, though. Hmm. Turkey has been skillful in telling those stories and in not ignoring the dispossessed, uh, the disenfranchised, um, the uncomfortable. Bollywood has, and Ra Rachel Dwyer, who's an academic mm -hmm. who studies Bollywood and film, makes a really interesting observation in a book that she wrote, I think, 10 years ago. She says in the older films, the household staff were a part of the story. There might be a sort of yes, ayah right. or a cook or a domestic staff who's a part of the story in a powerful way. And she says, you don't even see them in the films of today. They're just tucked away in the kitchen. They don't even have names or personalities or storylines. Well, I mean, that's... So we'll get to the, the dizzy, the, the form uh, in Turkey that's now... Um, all over the world, but 
one other aspect of this, the change that took place uh, in Hindi cinema or Bollywood after India liberalized, which is that, uh, and you cite Pankaj Mishra uh, as saying uh, that Bollywood created the mood music for Modi. Mm -hmm. So what is the link uh, that you see between the, rep the kind of India that's represented in Bollywood and the rise of uh, right-wing uh, uh, government and you know which is increasingly uh, belligerent, uh, exclusive, exclusionary, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's it's really a distinctly um, uh, aggressive, well, a cultural aggressiveness mm -hmm. in a way. And the example that I give is Kabi Khoshi Kabi Ram again. And there's a scene in that film. Which you know, if you if if we put it on today, you might have a bit of a giggle. It's that scene where Shah Rukh's son stands up in his English country public school, countryside public school, and he sings the Indian national anthem. And as he's singing it, somehow all these white English kids know the words and they stand up and start singing <laughs> it. And then everyone in the audience, you know, Shah Rukh stands up, the wife stands up, and then all these English aristocrats stand up. And <laughs> And the best part is there's a girl in a wheelchair. She can't stand up, so she raises her arms, you know, right. because she wants to be a part. So, okay, we can watch this and, and sort of say, oh, it's funny, or, you know, it's kitsch or whatever. But it has a, it has a political consequence. Mm -hmm. And the political consequence is that when that film was in the cinemas in India, a man in a Bhopal cinema was watching that film and was so moved by that scene that he actually did stand up in his cinema seat. And when he stood up, all the people behind him got annoyed and said, sit down and get out of our way and, you know, shut yeah. up. And he was so offended that he left and he began a protest outside the Bhopal cinema. And when that protest uh, didn't go anywhere, he filed public litigation and he took a case all the way to the Supreme Court to make it mandatory for people to stand for the Indian national anthem. Now, it was mandatory. That law was tweaked last year. So in 2018, it was they made it, optional again but but these are films with political consequence you know um, the NRI films of Karan Johar feed into a lot of this narrative um, again in God you know they all have K names I never understood why except that his name starts with a K uh, no not that yeah. one oh kuch kuch hota hai yeah. you know there's a lot of distinctly jingoistic, you know, they raise the flag every mm. morning. And, and what is interesting, actually, is that I think Indian films always had that. Indians are very nationalistic people. They're people who are very proud of their country, as are Turks. Turks are also very nationalistic people, very proud of their country. But you don't see Turkish flags in Dizzy. Mm. Nobody salutes the flag. Nobody wears a pin with the flag. There's no Turkish equivalent of Jay Hind in the Dizzy. Mm -hmm. um, and all that comes, but at the same time, I think Modi has been, you know, whether it's the modification of Bollywood or the other way around is unclear. But after Pakistan and India faced off in February, um, and any time two nuclear countries face off, that's a terrifying thing. You know, our air forces were engaged in dogfights for the first time since 1971. Um, and in, that was in February. And as Modi was campaigning during the elections, which took place in May in India, he said repeatedly that what happened with Pakistan in February was just a trailer. The full movie is to come. Mm. So there is a lot of this sort of crossover. Mm. And um, I mean, just look at the films that are coming out today. Mm. They're, you know, I mean, Lenny Riefenstahl would be embarrassed. <laughs> You know, the director of Dev das, das announced on Modi's birthday that he is going to make a film on Modi. It's, I, I'm embarrassed for him, you know, at least yeah. announced it the day after, <laughs> right. you know, not to be so obvious. We're going to take a short break here to talk about a couple of upcoming live webcasts at asiasociety.org. On January 27th, the Chinese businesswoman Lan Yan recounts her incredible life story in conversation with CNN correspondent Biana Golodriga. And on February 3rd, Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike, a 2019 Asia Game Changer honoree, will talk about challenges she overcame as a female politician in Japan, as well as her city's preparation for the 2020 Summer Olympic Games. 
Tickets are available for those of you who live in New York. Alternatively, you can watch these programs for free at asiasociety.org slash live. That's asiasociety.org slash L-I-V-E. And now let's get back to Fatima Bhutto and Nermeen Sheikh. But it's also the, the other connection. It's true, Karan Johar has a lot, uh, a big part to play in this. But it's also, and again, one doesn't know which comes first, but that... I think they rise together. And that NRIs have become, in this country, uh, one could say especially, um, extremely conservative and sympathetic yeah. to this Hindutva-type uh, ideology. Uh, I mean, there was just very recently that extremely embarrassing spectacle, the Howdy yeah. Modi. I know, it's hard thing. to pronounce yeah, it, isn't it? Because you don't know where Modi, the... Yeah. yeah. It was. It in was, Houston. It was chilling, in a way, to watch. Also, I, can't, I, ha- I was struggling to think of another world leader who wants to be on a stage with Trump for 45 minutes. <laughs> I couldn't really think of any, right. except maybe Bolsonaro. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so interesting the way pop culture has invaded o- all our lives and politics. And I've never thought pop culture is frivolous. I've always thought it's important to watch and we should be mm-hmm. suspicious of it. And those of you who watched um, the Pakistani prime minister's speech at the UN will also remember that he talked about pop culture. Um, Prime Minister Khan, in fact, referenced the great classic film Death Wish at the UN. Did you catch that? No. Yes. What is Death Wish? I don't even know. Death Wish. The Charles Bronson oh, film, Oh, I see, Death I see, right. I thought you were translating from some... Oh, no, no, film. it's not like a Hindi film. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, at all, it's an American film, and, mm. and he, he, he quoted Death Wish. I mean, I've never heard of a leader at the UN referencing mm-hmm. Death Wish. But, but it's, and he said, he said, you know, we've, we've grown up with Western movies mm. of the good guy who can take it no longer. That's exactly what he said. Mm. I think that's fascinating. And also, by the way, at the UN, Prime Minister Khan spoke about um, uh, an initiative... Uh, a television initiative, did you see that? Where Malaysia, Pakistan, and Turkey are going to come together to launch a new TV channel. Wow. One aimed at a, um, countering Islamophobia and presenting wow. a different face of the Islamic world. So c- pop culture is not silly at all. It's very serious stuff. And countries are thinking about it seriously. The problem is we're watching it innocently, thinking, oh, it's just entertainment. It's not right. entertainment. Um, you have to watch it with, with that discerning part of your brain that's asking... Who, who is exactly delivering this message to me? I mean, one of the things that I was very surprised by is that you say in the book about Turkey that it's second only to America in television distribution yeah. uh, all over the world. And that's thanks in large part to the genre that you talk about, yeah. Dizzy. So, so just explain what Dizzy is, first of all, for people who don't know, and why it can't be called a soap opera. So it, Dizzy is what the Turks call their television shows. They cannot call them <laughs> soap operas because they are a distinct genre. Uh, they are distinct in score. The, they have unique scores. They are distinct in the production. So each episode of a Dizzy is uh, about two hours and 15 minutes long. Um, they can go into, you know, they can be 20 episodes or they can be 300 episodes. Um, they can have as little as five cast members to 200 cast members. Um, they are, they range between epics set in, in the Ottoman era to modern dramas set in our present day. Um, they are, they, they abide by certain rules. A, a scriptwriter in Istanbul put them to me quite succinctly. Um, and one of them was that the hero of a dizzy will never hold a gun. Mm. That they are not very violent. I mean, okay, the ones about Ottoman conquest certainly will have war, etc. But it will never be the hero who is the man killing or the man employing violence. Um, they're very conservative. They're, they're in terms of uh, romantic storylines. Um, they... they Oh, gosh. Uh, you've seen, some of you have seen Dizzy? Mm-mm. Liars. <laughs> uh, they're on Netflix. You can see them on Amazon Prime. You can, um, you, it's difficult to get them on, on YouTube because Turkey geoblocks them. They don't want people to watch them on, on YouTube. Uh, but they're very popular. And just to give you a scale, so 
Um, if there's anyone here who grew up in India or Pakistan, you might remember watching The Bold and the Beautiful on Star Plus or Star TV in the 1990s. Yes, anyone? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Bold and the Beautiful, uh, which of course is an American soap opera, at its peak had been watched by a global mm -hmm. audience of 26 million people. But Magnificent Century, the Turkish dizzy about Sultan Suleiman, the Magnificent, at its peak, has been watched by upwards of 500 million people. It's amazing. So the only part of the world that the Turks haven't invaded with television is the English-speaking world. Which explains why no one here has Which watched Which explains Disney. here. But they're big in uh, South America. They're big in Eastern Europe. They're now getting into Western Europe. Um, they're huge in Asia. Well, the people that you spoke to are from what, why is it that they haven't come into the English-speaking mm. world? It's odd. Yeah, so when I asked people in Istanbul, they had a couple of, of theories. One, they said, you know, that English speakers don't like to read subtitles. They'll, they'll read subtitles for a film, but they're not going to read subtitles for two hours every night of the week. Mm. Um, that there's a discomfort there. And the second theory they had is because they're uncomfortable with the fact that these are cultural products coming out of the Muslim world. Mm. And I interviewed the head of uh, the studio that made Magnificent Century and that makes a lot of the big shows. And he said, you know, they shouldn't think of it like that. They should remember that we used to be the superpower of that era. We were the superpower of the world. We are, we used to be what America is today. And if they think about it that way, then they should be more comfortable. <laughs> 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 but I think that would only make people more uncomfortable, actually. But also the appeal. I mean, one of the things that uh, an actor tells you whom uh, you speak to for the book is that the appeal of this genre, um, he says that while American television is entertaining, it's not moving. He says, quote, it doesn't touch the feelings that make us human. Yeah. So from what you understand of its appeal, the people who you spoke to, it's very popular, of course, in, in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, not only in Pakistan, but also in Pakistan. Why does it resonate in a way that uh, other uh, television from elsewhere does not? I mean, including, in fact, uh, uh, Pakistani television. Mm -hmm. And speak in particular this thing, what you talked about earlier, the, uh, the role of, let's say, the domestic uh, oh, uh, yes. you know, within to yes. how they're not, in fact, erased from the That's right. story. So um, the, the actor who told me that is the actor uh, Khalid Ergenj, who, who plays Sultan Suleiman in Magnificent Century. And he also said that Turkish Dizzy essentially have followed the path of Ottoman expansion. Mm. It stops at <laughs> Vienna. <laughs> you know, it goes up until that point and then has a pause. <laughs> and... Funny. Also, when I met him in Istanbul, he sang Jive Jive Pakistan to me, um, <laughs> which was a bit shocking. And he said, oh, I, grow, I grew up singing it. We, you know, we always celebrate Pakistani national holidays. And wow. um, that was interesting. That was something I didn't expect, to be honest. Um, but yes, it's... So the Turkish shows are interesting because they are, they are about Ottoman kings and Ottoman queens and, and the rulers of, of dominions. But they are also about the poor. They're mm. also about the struggling. The domestic staff in the shows are not invisible. They are sometimes the central character with their own agency, with their own voice. Their storyline is separate. It's not told through the eyes of, of the madam, mm. let's say. And an interesting story is um, one that comes from a, an older show called um, Ashke Memnu or, or, or For Forbidden Love. And in this show, there's a, there's a widower and he has several children and he has a governess who looks after his children. And the governess is sort of in love with her employer. And the screenwriter, um, Ece Yurench, who's, who's a, a f quite phenomenal woman. I mean, she's one of the stars of Turkish television, and, and she makes sure to write empowered women in her shows, told me that the rights for the show were bought by an Indian channel. They showed it in India, but they wanted to make an Indian version of it. And the Indian screenwriter said to her, listen, we can't have a governess in love with her employer here. Mm -hmm. So can we make her his cousin? <laughs> 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 and she went, no, <laughs> you can't. So eventually they made her the dead wife's friend. Um, but that's a fascinating anecdote. I mean, it's so revealing 
The other one that I always mention, and there, and there are many more shows that speak to this. There are many more current shows. But, but for this book, I was looking at a few of the new shows, but really at the big ones that are responsible for this massive popularity. Um, the other one, of course, is a show essentially called What is Fatma Gul's Fault? And this is the story of a young girl uh, from a coastal town who's an orphan. She lives with her uncle and, or her brother and his wife who are bakers. And she uh, suffers a gang rape inflicted by the son of wealthy industrialist boys from Istanbul. I mean, you're not seeing that kind of thing in Bollywood no. anymore, you know? Definitely the not. industrialist son is the hero, not the villain. And in Turkey, you don't see that. And also the fact that Dizzy, uh, they're not, uh, you don't read subtitles, they're, they're dubbed in well, Urdu and then also speak about the Arabic, the Syrian Arabic. Yes, so, so in, if you watch uh, Turkish Dizzy on Netflix this evening, as I know you will, um, <laughs> they will be subtitled. But if you are watching a Turkish Dizzy in Chile, it will be in Spanish. And if you're watching a Turkish Dizzy in Karachi, it's going to be in Urdu. And part of its popularity, part of the way in which they, they traveled the world, is that they were bought by a Middle Eastern channel first. And the man who bought it, who I interviewed for New Kings, had a sort of flash decision. He decided two things. The first is that they were going to rename them uh, in Arabic. They were going to rename mm. the shows, and they were going to rename all the characters, which, I mean, didn't happen in Pakistan. In Pakistan, they have the same names. Mm. But in, in, in the Arabic version, so for in Forbidden Love, they changed their names. And his second decision was that he was going to dub it in the Syrian Arabic dialect. And that accounts for a lot of its popularity. Because of course, there is a modern standard Arabic, which is the Arabic you hear on the news, but then every country has their own particular dialect. And the Syrian dialect has always been considered the most beautiful. Mm. The most beautiful, the most poetic, and Syria, of course, before the war, had a big theater community. The government put a lot of money into television. They allowed TV shows to film in historic sites. You have a lot of university graduates in Syria who, who graduated in theater studies and acting. And, and w one of the things that happens is that, um, let's say the actor who plays uh, character X in a Turkish show will be called Adnan that same voice actor will play that actor in every show he does, hence, and they will always call him Adnan. Right? <laughs> so, so people grew very attached, and um, it really kicked off there, and it was from there that it traveled to the world. You know, I will say in the beginning, it was sort of embarrassing to turn up in a refugee camp and say, so, sorry, what are you watching on TV? <laughs> um, but it reveals a lot, actually, about, mm -hmm. um, about the experience of being displaced, and that's what I'm going to read from here. In our car, two floor fans have been switched on, blowing a gentle breeze of warm air against Sheikh Abdo, the camp's community leader's home. For the young and the old, these shows are a link to our past, he explains, drawing an elegant, super slim cigarette out of its pack and lighting it. They are a reminder of what the refugees once had the good fortune to experience before fate brought them here, to this converted garbage dump, now camp. Family, love, bonds of brotherhood, and friendship. Khadija, a mother of seven, clad in a long, regal, purple kaftan, has been in Al Ihsan for five years. She and her family had left the home she ever knew, Homs, and were shuttled across four cities by the Red Cross before being settled in Akar. Her husband worked in construction in Syria, but was unemployed here, even though there's so much building that needs to be done. Her five sons live in constant fear of being picked up by the Lebanese army. They don't have the right papers and are illegal in Lebanon. When they try to work, they get caught and get arrested. The Lebanese army and police eventually let them go, Khadija said, but it scares the women so much. Mm. The men get sick in jail. It's filthy there, so unhygienic. And the women, they get sick after from mental illness. When we spoke, out on the dirt road, a bus with a white decal of Jesus in profile on its back window, wearing a crown of thorns and a tear in his eye, drove by. As it ground past the narrow space between the camp and the world, a cloud of dust lifted up from the earth. Jesus save you, the decal said to no one in particular. 
I watch all the shows, Khadija told me emphatically, pressing her hands on my knees as we sat together on thinly stuffed, misshapen cushions. I watch them for the stories, love, defending love, defending each other, that's what I like. Her long hair was tied back in a bun and her face glowed as she spoke about the dizzy. It takes me away from here. I'm living in war and all I want to watch is romance. Sheikh Abdo must be in his early 40s. He's too young to be called Sheikh, but was given the honorific in appreciation of everything he's done for the displaced in the Al Ahsan camp. He inhales deeply from his slender cigarette, running a hand across his white stubble as he does so. All of them watch the TV shows here too. There's nothing at night to do except watch television. This small community of Syrian refugees has been in Lebanon since the start of the Syrian war, Sheikh Abdo says sadly and they'll stay here until there's a solution. The roof over our head is made of thin, silvery sheeting, and the home is bare except for one luxury item, a fridge, which hums audibly in the corner as we speak. Sheikh Abdo is not exactly a fan of Turkish television programs. He insists on making this clear to me. All that tension, it's too much. Sheikh Abdo says dismissively, too much gossip and too much int intrigue and too much suspense. Who can tolerate two hours of that every night? He was a teacher and a social worker before the war, and it's purely in this anthropological regard that he might join his fellow <laughs> exiles in watching an episode or two. In the early days of the war, people were obsessed with the news in the camps. At 4 a.m. sometimes, Sheikh Abdo would walk outside his brick and silver sheet home and see young men teenagers, kids even, outside on the dirt roads, pacing up and down in the dark, scouring their mobiles for news of home. They tell me so-and-so killed so-and-so, this guy blew himself up, they're 10 years old, but they know what's happening in Halab, which is the Arabic name for Homs. They knew who was a Shaheed and who was alive, still fighting. It's less intense now, he shrugs, exhaling a thin plume of smoke. Some of those youngsters have figured out that the news is nothing but lies. Seven years of war have taught the refugees that there's no hope to be found in breaking news. Mm. Put on the shows, the same boys say now, Sheikh Abdul recounts. Let's remember home. Let's remember Syria. But he doesn't join them, he reminds me. I don't want to watch the shows, he says. It's not home. It's Turkey. But it's better than the news, I ask. Sheikh Abdul's phone lights up with a WhatsApp call. It's been buzzing since we sat down. He glances at the screen for a moment, his brow furrowing before he looks at me. Of course, he replies, but it's still stress. And by the way, um, you know what I was saying earlier about the fact that the world is becoming middle class and that two thirds of that will be in Asia, the definition of becoming middle class is the ability to buy a fridge. Oh. That's what makes you middle class. I mean, that story, when I read it, you know, a few years ago, Democracy Now!, we went to Calais, uh, which at the time had the largest uh, refugee camp in all of Europe, Calais, France. And uh, there's only one little cafe there. There was now. The camp has been dismantled, um, which I don't know if any of you saw. There was a play at St. Anne's Warehouse called The Jungle. Uh, was it at, was it St. Anne's? Yeah. Right. So that, uh, it, the, the play centers on this cafe. So there's only this, this one cafe. And so when we were filming, we were there all day. It was freezing cold. I mean, not that we should complain, whatever. It was terrible for the people who lived there. Uh, we went into this one cafe. And there's a giant television in the corner mounted on this makeshift wall. And non-stop <laughs> Bollywood songs. <laughs> Well, this is you, extraordinary. You know, Khadija, who I just um, spoke about right now, she told she loved Dizzy, but she told me, she said, you know, my husband, he's such a pain, I can't get him away from the Bollywood. He watches it nonstop. And she said, and she took, <laughs> she took a sheet from the floor and she pulled it over herself like a sari and said, here, this is Bollywood, watch me now. <laughs> Which I thought was sweet. <laughs> Okay, so but before we, we open it up to the audience, I want you to say a little bit at least about, about uh, uh, K-pop, yeah. uh, Korean pop, yeah. what it is, yeah. why it's so uh, uh, popular now. Yeah. Um, so K-pop, um, I mean, is a massive phenomena, and it, it really is born 
quite interestingly. It has two sort of genesis points. The first is out of the bases. So one of the earliest K-pop groups, you could call it that at least, um, were a trio called the Kim Sisters. And you know they appeared with Dean Martin in the 1950s. They came on the Ed Sullivan show in this country something like 20 times. And they were discovered performing on the bases. So part of it has its genesis from there. And the more recent genesis comes from the Asian financial crisis. So in 1997, when Asia was wrecked, um, Korea was hit especially badly. And at that time, they had to take out what was then the largest ever bailout from the IMF. So in Korea, it's not the Asian financial crisis, it's the IMF crisis. And as they were struggling to rebuild their economy, it was very clear to them that they couldn't rebuild in the same way, relying mm. on Hyundai and, Sa and Samsung, you know, these monster kind of companies to see them through the recovery. And President Kim Dae-jung was inspired by Andrew Lloyd Webber and his musicals and Hollywood. And, and he was incredibly insightful and perceptive because he understood that pop culture required no organizational infrastructure. So you just needed talent and you needed time. Mm. So as early as the late 90s, Korea starts to, to lay the country with broadband internet. By 2015, the internet connections in Korea are 200 times faster than the average American internet connection. Mm. Um, and they put a lot of money into the cultural industries and a lot of training, so they issue these, these manuals on how to export culture with little, little factoids, like if you're going to the Muslim world, don't put a television show on during prayer time, mm -hmm. things like that. And, and what's happened actually is an explosion of Korean culture. It's, um, they're huge in, in video games, they're huge in television dramas, they make very sophisticated high culture films. And then there's K-pop, which is a $5 billion a year industry. And what's interesting to know about K-pop is that it relies on something called globalization, which is taking um, global and making it local. So they take Western pop music, Western tempo, and they speed it up. Mm. And it's that speeding up that makes it dancey, that makes it mm. positive and energetic sounding. And it's like Dizzy, like Bollywood, it's very... Um, tradi it's traditional and modern. Mm. So a K-pop video looks really slick and it's high production value. But the song lyrics are really, really, really sweet and unoffensive mm. and adorable. I mean, I can read you some, in fact, because I'll never remember them offhand. I've got it in a footnote. Hang on. Um, I mean, I know you're going to pretend, oh, I've never heard K-pop, but I know you all <laughs> probably listen to it too. Um, and it's also like a group there there I was surprised that there are like twenty people in a group or fifteen people in every band or something oh, like that. Yeah. They're massive. Hang on. I've just got to find where is it? Okay, I'll find it during the questions and I'll read it to you. But they're very wholesome lyrics. Um, they're not racy or suggestive. You don't need to beep out bad words in K pop. There are no bad words. And they are they are put through an industrial factory system. Mm. So it's not an accident that a band makes it big. It's mm. a strategic vision that makes them big. So before you've ever heard of a K-pop star, that star or that group or that band has been through three to five years of training. And hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent teaching them how to sing, how to dance, how to speak, how to stand, how to sit, how to eat, how to walk. How to They've had to undergo plastic surgery. Um, and then, yes, they have, um, part of the reason they have so many people in a band comes from the Japanese, because the Japanese taught the Koreans choral music when they were there. So they organized them into choruses, basically, and into choirs to sing. And so you'll have like 12 people in a K-pop band, and like one is the funny one, one is the sporty one, one is the laughing one, one is the sad one, one is the happy one, one is the, like, it's something for everyone. And then they have subunits. So you'll have um, the Korean unit, which is, let's say, the main unit. So there's a Korean band called EXO, and they have EXO-M, which is m for Mandarin. And there'll be an entirely new set of people that sing in Mandarin. And then you might have the J subunit for Japan, wow. and they will sing in Japan and wear Japanese clothes and all the rest. And there's a band called NCT that was here in America recently. And they are a terrifying concept. Billboard called them more of an idea than a band. 
because they're going to have limitless subunits. So they will have um, the Seoul subunit, the LA subunit, the New York subunit, the Hong Kong subunit, the, uh, every kind of subunit. And it's designed for the market. It's like a franchise. It's like, a, it's like Burger King. Right. Oh, here, hold on, I found the lyrics. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing this book, I had a bunch of sheets. So I had a, an Excel sheet for all of Shah Rukh Khan's films. You know, how many films does he cry in? He cries in all the films. Wow. And, I, and I asked him, I said, why do you cry in all your films? And he said, I've never cried in a film. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, and then I had um, synopses of, of, of the Turkish Dizzy, and then I wrote down song lyrics. Um, and it's, oh, by the way, sorry, one more thing. Part of the strategy is that Korean is a syllabic language, unlike Japanese or unlike Mandarin, and very much like English. That's why when you hear a Korean song, you can sing along with it, even though you don't know what they're saying. But what they do strategically is they always place a few English words. So there's something for you to hold on to and, and repeat at the top of your voice. And so I wrote down some of the English words. So there's a song called Dinosaur. And the lyrics are, the English lyrics are dinosaur, oh, 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 dinosaur. <laughs> That's the English. And then G Dragon has a song called Crayon. I mean, do you see how wholesome this is? Dragon, crayon. And the English words in crayon were swag, black, crack. Get your crayon. Get your crayon. <laughs> Get your crayon. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Asia in Depth. You can check out our show page at asiasociety.org slash podcast and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Asia Society. Next week, we bring you a conversation about the dangerous year and decade ahead in U.S.-China relations with Kevin Rudd, president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Here's a sneak peek. My view is that uh, the Chinese on balance would prefer to see Trump re-elected. Mm. Many in America will find that counterintuitive given the um, dynamics of the trade war. But from a Chinese perspective, uh, Trump um, has been keen to settle phase one uh, of the war. From a Chinese perspective, he hasn't uh, given the US military uh, authorization to embark upon any new robust military measures against China in the South China Sea or elsewhere. And from a Chinese perspective, uh, Trump is monumentally disinterested in human rights. I'm Matt Schiavenza. See you next time. <laughs>